We've come to see Lake Popo, Bolivia's second largest. In wetter days, it covered nearly 400 square miles. But the lake is all but gone. It's just a cemetery of boats. It's like the Sahara Desert coughed up a bunch of fishing skiffs or something. The water must have gone down so fast, people just had no way to get their boats out of here, and they just left them and moved on. Look at this little fishing boat. Whoever owned this thing must have decided, number one, there's no fishing left. Number two, I, I'll never get my boat out of here. Where am I going to put it? An entire lifestyle just evaporated with this lake. Lake Popo was a shallow lake, only about 10 feet deep. Its size always fluctuated with the seasons. It's even dried up before. But this time, no one around here thinks it's coming back. Village leaders in what was once the shoreline community of Choro are anxious. One of the worst droughts in Bolivia's modern history has left this region parched. Last fall, Bolivia's capital, La Paz, was literally running out of water. It's since rained a bit, but not here, 300 miles away. Right now we're on our way to a bridge to the only river of eight that is still feeding Lake Popo from Lake Titicaca. The other seven have completely dried up. This is the Desaguadero River. What swampland remains of Lake Popo is due to this influx of water. Choro town leader Mario Ibarra says the river is the region's last lifeline. Si no hay agua, muere el pueblo. Sí. Y hay algunos lugares que no tienen esa agua, no hay gente. With every passing month, the desaguadero brings less and less water, and it's more and more polluted. Animales, pero personas sí. no. No. Let's see how it comes coming. ¿Y ustedes beben entonces de, de agua este plástico? Sí, ahorita, en esta época, sí. pero después, marzo, abril, mayo, muy poco. Ya no haber esto del río que tomamos. Haciendo hervito, this. The water here used to be crystalline, but then something began to change. Hours away and slightly higher on the Bolivian plains. It's called El Alto. Once a small suburb above the capital, La Paz, it's now home to nearly two million people. Sewers here are in short supply. Waste management, virtually non-existent. Most human waste from this megalopolis runs into the ground. Garbage goes into open landfills. When it rains, all of it washes downhill and into tributaries that feed another well-known Bolivian lake, Titicaca. On the border with Peru, two hours northeast from El Alto, Titicaca is the world's highest navigable body of water some 900 legendary square miles of blue. Well, blue and increasingly slime green. We got to the lake about 30 seconds ago and we've already found our first dead fish. One local mayor, Alfredo Ferrero, is deeply worried for the lake's future. Ya se nota porque en las orillas del lago el color ya es diferente y además los peces ya están Apareciendo muertos, los caraches desaparecen también algunas veces. Eh, el lago medio oscuro ya, ya no es cristalino. Unos cinco años atrás más o menos ha empezado ya este tema porque al principio la gente misma estaba esperanzada de que con la pesca que tenían las personas, pensaban que van a mantener ahí, pero no es así. Ferrero and several area mayors huddle at an emergency meeting to discuss the problem and hopefully find solutions. Octavio Quispe calls what's happening liquid injustice. No sacan agua limpia de las cordilleras, utiliza la ciudad y la ciudad nos devuelve agua contaminada prácticamente que afecta a los originarios, a las comunidades que son originarios de la región. ¿Y qué pasaría si llega un turista a este lago tan mítido y huele a aguas negras? No, sería pues eh, prácticamente desastroso la imagen misma, ¿no? Ojalá que esta contaminación no avance. Tenemos islas en el lago que son, que tienen atractivos turísticos. We head for one of those islands with researcher Gonzalo Lora. But first, a detour into the Totora. You can't do this 
with an amateur uh, sailor because you can get stuck in the Totora. Totora is a sedge that thrives in Titicaca's shallower waters. It's a sanctuary for ducks and frogs and fish. In some communities, they've even made floating islands out of it. It's also a natural barrier against a lot of human pollutants, soaking them up for their nutrient value. But the waste flow into Titicaca is overwhelming the Totora. This is causing the algae to bloom out of control, setting off a dangerous chain of events. Contaminants come in, they cloud up the water, that blocks the sun, and that allows the algae underneath to bloom. Yes, sir. And they take oxygen out of the water, and that affects the natural plants and the fish. Yes, down there, they begin to bloom anaerobic uh, bacteria. So they, in their process, liberate uh, uh, hydrogen sulfur. Okay. That it's a hydrogen sulfur that smells, and that kills the frogs, the fish, all that kind of, uh, of biodiversity, and affects all the food chain. And it stinks. Not really. No, it gets worse than this? Yeah. Oof, imagine that. Much worse. The strong smell wafts up over the nearby island of Suriki, home to some 500 people. Gervasio Quispe is a resident and local historian. He takes me up the mountain to show me what they're up against. Había muchos peces cuando yo era niño. ¿Sí? No había esas redes. Solamente nosotros en, entrábamos a la orilla. ¿Sí? Hay algas que hay, hay. entonces los sacamos junto a las algas, cogían a los peces. ¿Ah, sí? ¿Tantos sí, peces sí, había? Tantos. Nos criábamos las truchas y llegó la agua turbia. Cuando una mañana nomás vemos todas las jaulas, las truchas muertas. Quispe says he's worried that bad water down there could leach into the island's natural spring, the town's only source of water, this tiny trickle. Y cuando la sequía estaba muy fuerte, ¿cuánto tiempo esperaba la gente aquí para, tener, para llenar sus bedones? Un bedón de, do, de 20 litros, más o menos, eso siempre traen, algunos de 10, 5, así. Digamos, de 20 litros a... Por lo menos 10 a 15 minutos. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Entonces, la espera en la cola, ¿cuánto cola, era la espera? Según la llegada. Por eso muchas veces uh, sigue ahora. Venimos a las 3 de la mañana. To stop the steady onslaught of wastewater, Bolivia and Peru have formed a partnership to build waste treatment plants. Bolivia has earmarked $85 million for two plants already. But experts say at least 20 treatment centers are needed because the damage being done reaches beyond the lake itself. Other UNESCO tourist sites, such as the 800-year-old ruins at Tiwanaco, will also suffer, says this local guide named Marcelo. Marcelo, like most Bolivians, believes it's not too late for Titicaca. But pollution is one thing. The pattern of ever drier weather is another. Titicaca's tributaries are evaporating because of it. The lake is two meters shallower than normal. That's a drop in this highland bucket, but enough to stop runoff from flowing further downhill via the Desaguadero River Remember which lake that feeds? Lake Popo. In the tiny community of Pasna, few people hold out, like this woman, Mercedes, who's trying to grow quinoa on the lake bed itself. ¿Usted se acuerda de aquí? Antes se pudo ver el lago. Sí. Aquí estaba el, el, el agua también. Sí, el agua también, antes. Y la tierra aquí es muy buena para sembrar. Un poco salitres. Here at Popo, a vicious circle closes. Urban sprawl pollutes one lake, drought and global warming choke off this one entirely. In a way, Mercedes' little farm is a symbol of how resigned people now are. After all, if you really have hope that your lake's coming back, you don't start farming on a spot that should be underwater.